Um, probably the most uh, talked about issue of the day in the United States these days, and uh, uh, you know, traveling in Israel and, and in Europe, uh, when people talk about the U.S., it seems to come up uh, very frequently in conversations. And there's a major election right now in the U.S. Uh, that will have a lot of bearing on this issue. Is the issue of health care? Uh, there is a massive debate and a massive uh, new legislation uh, with regard to the situation of health care in the United States. And what's the problem, we are told, with health care in the United States? Well, it's too expensive. Costs, you know, a huge percentage of GDP is being spent on health care. We all know there's some optimal level of GDP that we should be spending on health care. And we've exceeded that optimal level, we are told. Uh, there are many, anywhere between 20 to 30 million people, who are uninsured, don't have health insurance in the United States. And that, we are told, is a real serious problem. So, it's too expensive, we're told. People don't have it, we're told. And the solution is obvious. What's the solution? The solution is, well, government needs to do something. Government needs to act. We need to, we need to force people to get insurance. We need to subsidize their insurance. We need to lower costs, because costs are too high. So the immediate response is more government. More government in spite of the fact that, you know, if you, if you look at American health care, you'll find that somewhere close to 50 cents of every dollar spent on health care in the United States is spent by the government. So you've already got the government being a major purchaser of health care, and yes, the price, the price, the price is to see, keep going up. So now we want government to buy more health care, and the expectation is prices will go down. Um, you look at health care, and you see massive regulations throughout the entire industry. In order to make healthcare cheaper, more accessible, more available, more comprehensive, and so on. Government is everywhere in healthcare. There is no market. There is no free market. There is no uh, free choice in healthcare in the United States. It is completely, or you know, well, half of it is government run, and the other half is government regulated. So, what is it? that leads people so instinctually. And, and by the way, you know, if you read the polls and you read the newspaper articles, a lot of people in the US against this health care plan, right? The polls are you know, uh, somewhere around 40% are for it and somewhere around 55, 60% are against it. But a lot of the people against it are against it because it doesn't do enough. So when you actually look at why people reject the health care plan, a significant percentage of them are rejecting it because it's not, you know, it's not enough of government intervention. And a lot of them are against it because it's so, this particular plan is so obviously corrupt. I mean, people were paying buckets of money to vote for this. Um, and, and people just don't like the sleaziness. But nobody, or oh, very few Americans, are actually objecting to the idea that government needs to step in here and take care of health care somehow. Make sure that insured get their insurance and lower the costs in some way. There's almost there's a there is this a minority that thinks the government should stay out of it. But it's a minority. When the Republicans proposed an alternative to what Obama was proposing, it was basically the same thing that the Democrats had proposed, just fewer pages. You know, it was simple. It was less government intervention, but still an increase in government intervention. Just Slow. You know, the Republicans in the U.S. want socialized everything just at a slower pace than the Democrats. You get it faster with the Democrats. So why is it? Why is the response, why is the energy so much behind this notion of there's a perceived problem, let's get the government involved, let's get the government to solve it, let's increase the role of government. And I think it has to do with the fact that um, there are people out there that have a need for health care, and that need is not being met. 
So the people out there who are suffering, who are not getting the kind of care they would like to get, they would imagine to get, the people who are spending more than they would like to spend on health care, the people who feel, and this is very much an emotional level, feel like they should get more. And the people, most, most people look at them and say, yeah, you should get better treatment. You, it should be cheaper. It's, it's not fair somehow. The healthcare debate really comes down to this question of fairness, this issue of need. Some people need it, and they deserve it, and they should have it, and we need to find a way to provide it. And that need is perceived today as a right. People have a right to health care. They have a right to the treatment that they want. They have a right to get that treatment cheaply, not to pay too much for it. And if somebody has a right to something, if we perceive that somebody has a right to health care, to food, or to a living wage, or to, then, then who's going to provide that right? Whose job is it to provide for rights, to defend rights, to protect rights, to take care of the rights of people? Well, let's go. <coughs> so if somebody has a right to health care, then we need to provide him with health care. And the only entity that can provide that is government. People have a need for jobs, they have a right to a job, then the only entity that can provide provide for a right is government. <laughs> and that's right. The role of government is to protect individual rights. That's the central characteristic of the American government. It's in its founding documents. And if we define healthcare as a right, if we define housing as a right, as we did before this crisis, we talk about this banking crisis, this housing crisis. A lot of it, a lot of it came about because housing was perceived as some kind of right, and the government spent huge amounts of money subsidizing it. If you want to, if you want me to go through the causes of the financial crisis, you can ask me in the Q and A, and I'd be happy to go through that quickly. But the idea that housing is a right is a big part of the cause of what happened. Here. So, how we define rights is crucial. Because there's no question that if we define it over health care and over all these other things, then big government, socialized government, government intervention, government involvement is going to only escalate. Now, of course, it, it's, it should be quite obvious to people that there's something wrong with the notion that somebody has a right to health care. Because if somebody has a right to health care, then somebody else is obligated to provide him with that right to health care, right? I mean, it has to come from somewhere. The health care is a product, a good, a service that somebody is providing. And if you have a right to health care, and I'm a doctor, then what position does that put me as a doctor? Well, I am obliged. The government is going to force me to provide for your health care. But what about my right to decide who I see and who I don't see? How much I charge for my services, how much I don't charge? What kind of procedures I do and what kind of procedures I don't do? What about my rights to do what I think is good for me? Well, who cares? Or we don't care. And the doctors. They all get together and they say, wait a minute, we've got rights too. And these people come and say, well, but we've got rights, so what do you get? You know, you get a doctor's lobby and a pharmaceutical lobby and an insurance company lobby and a patient's lobby and, you know, all kinds of lobbies. Every little group out there comes out and says, we've got rights too. And how do we decide on policy? Well, whoever manages to manipulate the political process best. Wins out. You know, deals are cut, people are appeased, and everybody gets a little peace, and politicians then vote on what you know they think will maximize their ability to get reelected. But rights then turn into this battle between groups that all 
all claim to stand for individual rights. They stand for what America was founded on. Right to health care, the right to be a doctor, do what I what I think is right to be a doctor, the right of pharmaceuticals to make a profit, or, but it's all rights. And there's no standard. The standard is who has the most, I mean, you would think in a democracy generally the standard is who has the most votes, but how do you get those votes? Well, you get those votes by who has the most pull, by who manipulates the political process the most. You know, it's a little civil war. Every time you get something like health care, what you get is a little civil war going on behind the scenes where people are pushing and pulling in order to get the best outcome for themselves possible. But is there a standard for what a right is? When we talk about the government's role in defending and protecting individual rights, what does that actually mean? And where does that actually come from? If we go back to the founding documents of, of the United States, in the Declaration of Independence, it says we shall have a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And in any of a right to those. What does that actually mean? Now these, these concepts are really important. They shape the way we think about politics. They shape the way we think about the role of government. They shape the way we think about what government should and shouldn't do. So it's really important that we understand what rights are and how they've been perverted and distorted and corrupted and used in a way that the founding fathers of America would find horrific. And we should all find horrific. And we should all have the tools to be able to fight for them. And I think that most commentators out there, both on the left and the right, have gotten this issue of rights wrong because they don't understand what the concept is and where it fundamentally comes from. So what is a right? What do we mean when we talk about individual rights? And, and here I think Ayn Rand um, builds on the Enlightenment thinkers of Locke, on the founding fathers, on the tradition of rights, but I think brings their own uh, unique views to this question. Ayn Rand writes a manifestation of that truth. <coughs> The manifestation of morality. The, the application of morality to politics. Fine-man morality is primarily an individual's responsibility. Primarily deals with how individuals to deal with their own life, with themselves. With how they interact, not so much with the world out, other people, but with their world, with themselves. Their own moral responsibilities to themselves. But we all live in a society. We all live among other people. Rights are the rules in a sense. They're the standards by which we interact with other people. They're the application of a specific moral code, a specific moral view to how we interact with other people. And therefore, to understand the corruption of rights, you have to understand different views of ethics. You have to understand the prevalent views of morality out there in the culture. And to understand the proper view of rights, you have to understand a proper moral view. Rights are about the individual. Individual rights are code that determines freedoms of an individual, the freedom of action, rights fundamentally about actions. When you say the right to life, it means that you have a right to pursue those actions necessary to sustain your own life. It means that you have the right to do whatever is necessary to take care of yourself, to be left free, to think, and to act in any way that you view as beneficial to your life. That's essentially what rights are. And there is only one right. Fundamentally, that's the right to life, the right to property, the right to free speech, 
the way to liberty, the way to pursue one's happiness, and to ruin of the one idea that we as individuals need to be left free, left alone to pursue our lives. To pursue a life proper to human beings. So rights, you know, people talk about our rights negative or rights positive. There's a whole debate about positive rights and negative rights. In a sense, they're both. Rights are positive in the sense that it says you as an individual, you are free. They're negative in a sense that to tell your neighbors that while each one of them is free to pursue their own life, the negative is they can't violate your rights. So you can pursue your life as long as you're not violating, as long as you're not prohibiting the ability of others to pursue their rights. Now, how does one violate rights? How does one violate rights? The only way to violate somebody's right, we're talking about freedom of action, right? freedom to pursue your life. So what is it that's going to interrupt your ability to pursue your life? What is it that can stop you from doing the things that you actually believe are going to make your life the best life that it can be? There's really only one thing out there that other people can do to you to prohibit you from pursuing your life, and that is force. That is violence. And, you know, violence, force, can also be fraud. But it's stepping in your way. It's stopping you. It's putting a gun to your head. It's deceiving you. And that's what your neighbors are not allowed to do under the system of rights. The system of rights recognizes the individual sovereignty to go after his own life free of coercion, free of force, free of other people using force to dictate what they think he should be doing. It's simple. It's laissez faire, leave us alone. That's what the doctrine of individual rights really stands for. Think about healthcare. How can healthcare be a right? In a sense, it is a right. right? You have a right to healthcare. In the sense that you have a right to pursue healthcare. The government should not stop you from visiting your doctor. The government should not interrupt your decision together with your physician to choose what treatment you should get or what treatment you shouldn't get. The government should not use force to tell a doctor what medicines he can't prescribe to you and what medicines he cannot prescribe to you. That's your right to healthcare. Your right to pursue healthcare. Free of anybody else's force upon you. Indeed, the government's job is to, if there's a fraudulent doctor or a doctor who steals or cheats, then the government's role is to come in and protect you from those kind of people to protect you from their use of force against you. But other than that, the government has no law. It has no place to step in. And how is the only way it can provide you with health care? How can the government provide you with health care? Only by using force and taking it from somebody else, whether it's taking money or whether it's forcing a doctor to do stuff he does not want. So, when people talk about a right to health care, they're talking about violating some people's rights in order to give you something you have not earned. The real right to health care is just basically the individual right to be left free. A need, just because you need something, does not give you the right to take it from others, to steal it from others. To demand it from others, you can ask. But individual rights, a free country, it means that if you need something, you have a right to go and do the best that you can do to pursue it. Whether it's again healthcare or a job or wealth or an iPod or an iPhone, you have a right to earn a living and buy these things. 
Now, so the essence of individual rights is to protect individual freedom. The whole revolution of individual rights is a revolution that says that we're not going to put state first and we are all slaves to that state in some form or another, or collective, or group, or somebody's need first. The whole revolution of individual rights is that we're going to put the individual first and make the state the individual's servant. Government is a servant of the people. And what does that mean? It means that government plays a role, one role, and that is to allow people to stay free, to leave people free. So it takes away the crooks and the frauds and it arbitrates disputes, but otherwise it has no role. Now, the left, the left would like us to believe that rights are not based on anything in reality. They're just whatever, you know, they're, they're complete subjectivists. Uh, they would like us to believe that rights are just invented, that indeed rights are gifts. Right? Rights are gifts that government provides us. So again, rights to health care, the right to a minimum wage, all those are gifts from the government. And yes, they say, conflicts inherent in human nature. The fact that there's a conflict between the gift that I'm giving the doctors and the gift that I'm giving you know, the patient, the fact that there are conflicts there, that's just life, and that's what we need politics for, and that's why we need democracy. We need to be able to vote on all these things. And ultimately, to them, all this boils down to you know, absolute democracy. Again, democracy that's being influenced in the background, but if you can get the votes, then it's good. The majority rules. Now, anybody who really understands rights as individual freedoms, that's incompatible with this notion of democracy. Democracy is anti-individual rights. Democracy is the tyranny of the majority. That's not my statement, that was what the funny fathers of America called it. You know, when Athens didn't like what Socrates was doing in the streets of Athens, he was corrupting the youth, right? he was telling them that maybe those myths about the gods weren't true. Lots of back and forth, and challenging their ethics, and challenging their religion. So what did the... And this is pure democracy, right? Uh, well, not everybody voted. You had to be a landowner, and you could only be male, and so on. But it was, it was pretty close to real democracy. Everybody got into a big, you know, amphitheater in, in Athens, and they all voted. And I don't know what the percentage was, but, you know, it was more than 51% voted to shut him up. And the most effective way to shut up as, uh, Socrates was have him drink some poison. And Socrates, being a real staunch defender of democracy, you know, Plato comes to him and says, I've got a tunnel, let's run. Socrates says, no, I believe in democracy, the people have spoken, and he drinks the poison and dies. But that's democracy, right? If 51% of the people think they should, we should build a tennis court on my house, then that's what should be done. Right? Individual rights say, if I have a right to my own property, then 99%, 99.9%, I'm assuming I'm voting against, 99.9% of the people come want to build a tennis court on my property, and they can't. And if Socrates, everybody in Athens could hate Socrates, and yet his right to speak is inalienable. But it's not just his right to speak, his right to use his property, his right to go see a doctor, his right not to go see a doctor, his right to buy insurance or not to buy insurance, his right to do whatever he thinks is good for him, is inalienable. It doesn't get decided by a vote. And you'll notice that, um, you know, Democrats or the left, uh, once they have big votes, you know, they want to have a big federal government where all the votes happen. Uh, and Republicans, and so the right in the U.S., is still okay with democracy, they just want to have small votes. They want to do it on a local level. So they, they're not okay with the federal government stealing my home, but they're okay with the local government stealing my home. <laughs> Turning it into a tennis court. 
state rights, they call it, or county rights, or city rights, or whatever they call it. But there is no such thing. There's only one concept of rights, and that is individual rights. And the individual rights cannot be taken away, should not be allowed to be taken away by any size body. Doesn't matter if it's a local council, doesn't matter if it's a state, doesn't matter if it's a big evil federal government. Rights are inalienable. Democracy inherently is anti that the concept of individual rights. It's inherently uh, against the individual. So pure democracy, the idea of majority rule, is, is a way in which both the left and the right get around the concept of rights. And they, you know, and, and rights lose their meaning as they have in the United States as a concept. The right, of course, claims to be more for the founding fathers' concept of individual rights. They claim to stand for what they view as rights, but they never define it. They never explain it. In this whole healthcare debate in the United States, nobody on the right has really emphasized that this is a massive violation of individual rights. There's no real discussion because they have a problem because where do these rights come from? Well, all they've got is, they have no idea of a basis for where these rights come from. And therefore, they always fall back on what the Declaration of Independence unfortunately fell back on. And that is that they come from God. They're just here, mystically. They just arrive. And that's just not a very good argument. Anytime when you say, I know this to be true because... I've got a connection to. You you guys don't have it either. So I'll, I'll tell you how to do it because I have that connection. That's not a good policy in terms of convincing anybody of an idea. It's not a rational explanation. It's not based on reason. Therefore, it's not workable. Now I mentize the concept of rights to our nature. Our nature as individuals. Our necessity to produce for ourselves, a necessity to live our own lives, the necessity of using reason, and the fact that the, the obstacle to reason, the primary obstacle to reason, really ultimately the only obstacle to reason is force. And force has to be eradicated from human life so that we as individuals can live the best life that we can. That is the tie of rights to the nature of human beings, the nature of us as individuals. So the right and the left get it wrong, and as a consequence, there's almost no discussion today about concepts like rights. There's a complete perversion of what capitalism means. You know, capitalism is just just some government intervention, not too much. Nobody can define what too much is, and of course, as a consequence, it continuously grows. And, and the discussion is about my new show over here and my new show over there, rather than about the principle. There's a real principle. And the principle is individual rights. Leaving people alone. Letting them pursue their own happiness, their own life, in the way that they, um, that they view as most rational. As the way that they view fits them. So, you don't have to look at the whole healthcare debate you don't have to get into the whole the details from beginning to end. It involves violating individual rights and therefore it's wrong. And, you know, the Republicans, you know, they, they, they want to say that, and sometimes they do, and there was this article in the Wall Street Journal that uh, head of the Republican uh, Party, um, Steele, wrote, where he says, look, we don't believe in government-run health care. We're against government-run health care. We think this is a really, really bad idea. But Medicare, I don't know if you guys know, Medicare is uh, government-run health care for the elderly, right, in, in the United States. It's government. That's good. But what's that? There's no, they can't have a principle there because they, they have nothing to ground that principle on. So health care for the elderly is good because they need is greater, I guess. So it's okay because they really, really, really need it. It's okay to violate other people's rights to give it to them. If you only need it a little bit, it's not okay to violate your rights. 
That is not a winning argument. So, if we're going to fight for capitalism, and, and when I say capitalism, I don't mean the system that existed in the United States two years ago that failed. I mean a system of free markets, of no government intervention in our lives. If we're going to fight for capitalism, then we have to fight for the concept of individual rights. We have to fight for the idea, the proper definition of individual rights. And if we're going to fight for a proper definition of individual rights, then we have to fight for individualism, for the idea that we are sovereigns of our own life. That nobody has a right. That nobody should be able to tell us what we can and cannot do. That we know we're not sacrificial animals to the state. That we don't live for the sake of a group, for the sake of a country, for the sake of a state. We live for our own sake. And that is the central concept. The central point is, who does your life belong to? If it belongs to you, then government needs to get out of the way. If it belongs to the state, then we're on the road to serve. That's the, that's the fundamental choice that we have to make, and those are the fundamental ideas that we have to fight for. Thank you all. sort of I and these sort of freer ideas we have. On an intellectual hit level here, I think everyone can listen to this and go, ah, oh, this is a great speech, you know, we can understand what you're saying. My main interest though is, is, is getting those people who have less of an interest in politics to under understand our ideas. And one of the key ideas I think we have a problem with is there is a muddle, as I think you mentioned it, that what we have today, this idea that we still have capitalism when really it's just this sort of state-backed corporatism. I'd like to know your thoughts on how we unmuddle that and present a simple argument to, to people who have maybe a lesser interest in politics. Well, let me first address a danger that I think exists, and, and even in the terms you use, state-backed corporatism I think is a, is, a, is a dangerous term, and I think one that I would avoid, although I know most libertarians use it uh, quite extensively. Um, because state that corporatism would suggest that the real villains here are the corporations. Now, I'm not saying that the corporations are good guys, but I don't think they're the villains. They do things I don't like, but everybody out there is doing stuff they don't like, and they have huge influence, sure. But I don't think they're the villains. Um, so I think there are two issues here. One, who is the villain? And I think that needs to be explained. Um, and second, um, how do we describe the system that exists today? Uh, now, let me start with the second one because it's easier. I think what we have today is, it's a simple concept. What we have today is a mixed economy. We have a mixture. Yes, there are elements of capitalism. Yes, you can go to the mall and you're free to choose what you can buy. Nobody's forcing you to buy a particular product versus the Soviet Union where you were told this is what you buy and you only have one choice and that's it. So there are elements of freedom out there. There's no question about that. You can't deny that. But they're only elements. Because, for example, you're free to choose, but the choices are limited by subsidies and regulations and controls and everything else that's going on where the government is, 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 has its fingers in your life and in the life of the manufacturers of the products that you're purchasing. So we need to describe the system as what it really is. It's a mixture of freedom and coercion, a mixture of capitalism and socialism. With the element of socialism, at least in the United States, in the UK is a little bit, you know, you've gone through more cycles, but in the US, systematically, the element of socialism increasing, systematically, for the last hundred years. And then you need to link that to their economic, you know, the economic consequences of that, which are quite brutal these days. And, and you can easily show that the economic consequences are not the result of the freedom elements within society, but a result of the government regulations. It's not that hard to do 
if you have, you know, if you have somebody's attention. Um, and personal freedoms, are they going away? And you have to appeal to people's you know, fundamental love of freedom because I think most people do want to be free. Most people do want to make their own choices about their own lives. It's, you know, you have to convince them that it's okay to let other people make choices about their own lives. Everybody's, everybody's happy with the choices they're making. It's other people they don't trust and they want, and they want to go after. Um, so I think, I think you have to explain the system as it is. So, you know, banks in the United States are, you know, I like to say 80% government, 20% capitalism and free. And banks are the ones that collapse, right? High tech is 80% free, 20% government, and it's doing pretty well. Not an accident. And you can, you can show that. Um, so, yes, I agree with you. We have to communicate better the notion that capitalism is not what we have today. Capitalism is not what failed. Capitalism, indeed, has not really even been tried. It, you know, we dabbled in it a little bit in the 19th century, but we didn't really do it all the way right, even in the 19th century. And it's interesting, even in the 19th century, the areas we got dabbled in are the areas that did really, really badly, like railroads, you know, they, they didn't survive in the United States uh, very well into the 20th century because of government, uh, government intervention. Banking and, and other areas like that, land, land use. Um, so you can show, you can correlate government intervention with people's standard of living, with with the quality of people's lives, and with their freedom. Now, why I don't think it's helpful to go after corporations, although it's it's populist and it, it has a big appeal and it's it, it seems to it plays well. Um, Fundamentally, business, small and large, their fundamental activity is, um, is a huge value add to each one of our lives. It is a huge contributor to our ability to live well. Um, and the left hates them. The left hates them for being businesses. They don't hate them because they're big. They, don't, they hate them for making money. They hate them for the profit motive. They hate them for their, their very existence. They hate the idea of a corporation. They hate the idea of a business. And we need to be very careful, and, and to some extent the right does too, particularly if they make too much money. We need to be very careful not to play into that. And, you know, I, I see, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Ron Paul, in the US, but Ron Paul does this a lot. He, he lambasts Wall Street. He goes after them, and he plays right into the hand of the leftists who, who say, you know, it's all paper shuffling. They don't do anything. But that's BS. That's just not true. They do something incredibly productive. And they do something incredibly productive in spite of all the regulations. And yes, when government is going to round up and regulate their industry, as they're going to do right now, they're going to spend gazillions of dollars to make sure that they get as much benefits as they can from it and to help with everybody else. But the problem is not them. The problem is government. The problem is that government has the power to regulate them to begin with. The problem is that government has the ability to choose winners and losers. If the government is going to choose winners and losers, and you're a big company, who are you going to, who are you going to try to, what, part, what pile are you going to try to be in? You're going to try to be in the pile of the winners. I mean, you'd be stupid not to. I'll give you a, an easy example. Microsoft used to spend Zero dollars on lobbying in Washington. Zero. None. They just, you know, that was Washington. None of their business. They did their thing. They created all this wealth, all these opportunities with no lobbying of government at all. And then the Justice Department went after them for antitrust. And they got hammered. They got hammered here in, in, in the U.S. And then the Europeans went after them. And they just, guess what? Microsoft today spends tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars lobbying in Washington. And when a bill comes up that affects high tech, and that bill is going to choose between winners and losers, is Microsoft going to spend a fortune to try to make sure that they're in the winner's pile? Absolutely. And if you're CEO of Microsoft and you don't do that, you're violating the fiduciary duty towards your shareholders. So the problem is not Microsoft. Or Citibank, or... or, or, or or Goldman Sachs, you know, right? 
The problem is that politicians have the power to pick winners and losers. The problem is that politicians introduce bills that are going to hurt some and benefit others. The problem is the morality that allows you know, all of this to exist. It's a, it's a, this is an intellectual philosophical debate. This isn't about the, I mean, let's, let's get away from what I described earlier. This pressure group versus that pressure group. No, what ideas are driving the very existence of these pressure groups? That's what needs to be attacked. And I, I think when we play big business as bad business, is, is it, we play into the hands of the wrong people. And yes, you know, we get some populist appeal, but I think it's short-lived and it, 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 it's not last. Business, by its very nature, is good. Yes, they are bad businessmen who pervert it and use Washington in order to gain advantage. And we need to attack them. And, 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 but don't attack business qua business or big business qua big business. Attack mm -hmm. Jeff Emelt because he goes to Washington to beg for handouts. Attack... Uh, you know, it wasn't even GM that asked for bailout. They were bailed out whether they wanted to or not, right? I mean, government forced it down their throats. Uh, you know, attack Citibank for, for getting another bailout. But don't attack big business, qua big business. Attack the particulars, the particular instances where they are going after. Attack the particular businessmen who are the Leslie Moochers or who are the Orrin Boyles, if you read out the shrug. The, the, the particulars, but not as a group, because I think we do we do them and we do ourselves a disservice and the cause of disservice when we when we attack them. Yes, since we're in the hands of Parliament, do you think that objectives are to seek political office, or are they likely to be captured by the system? I, I you know, it's a tricky question because we've got we've got a great example, a negative example, of an objectivist who was captured by the system. Uh, and that is, uh, for those of you who know, that is Alan Greenspan, um, who I think is, is uh, proof that power corrupts and that absolute power, which you certainly have as Federal Reserve Chairman, corrupts absolutely. Um, I, I think Alan Greenspan was corrupted by the system. He was corrupted by power, by, by the, you know, by the, the, uh, the, he cared more about the kind of people he mingled with in the parties and people's attitudes towards him than about the truth. And I, and I think that completely corrupted his ability. So, I guess it depends. Uh, if you're an Alan Greenspan, don't go into politics, you only give us a bad name. Um, if, if you have integrity, which I don't think Alan does, if you're a person of integrity, I don't think you have to be corrupted by the system. Uh, the question really is, is what can you do? What is the best way to change the world? Um, and I think we're going to need politicians. Um, whether it's now or down the road, they're going to have to be objective politicians. They're going to have to be people who stand up on principle and, and oppose things on principle and are not willing to cut deals. But you have to realize that if you go into politics under that guy, first of all, it's going to be tough to get elected. Uh, second, you know, you're going to make a lot of it. You're not going to be a popular guy. You're just, you know, people are not going to like you. And you have to be able to have the, you know, the backbone to, to stand up to that. Because, you know, if you believe in principles, then it's not just about the lesser two evils. It's not just about getting the best compromise you can. It's about, and I think we're at the stage where we need people who say, no, we're not going to support this. Even if it's better than also. Politician. Yes. <laughs> in, in order to try to rein in government, some of us on the centre right in Britain have actually argued that far from abandoning faith in democracy, we should be using radical direct democracy to try to make the state much more immediately accountable to the people and therefore to try to curtail it and in fact do the job that if we had a functioning legislature, it would actually be doing itself. And that is to rein in the, the ambitions of the politicians and to, to shrink what is defined as public policy. You seem to suggest that actually democracy is, is more radical, direct democracy is actually not the way forward. Um, I'd be interested in your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it is a strategy that will uh, backfire. Um, because the principle behind it is, is I think, wrong. Uh, government is not about direct democracy of the people. Government is about 
you know, protecting people from, you know, from voting away the minority rights for the sake of the majority. And any group that you have, uh, you know, you're always going to be able to call out a majority that's going to screw the minority. And what is the ultimate minority? The ultimate minority is the individual. The whole idea of government is to prevent that, is to prevent any gang or group of going after the individual. It's to, it's to protect individual rights, and therefore shrinking it, I don't think, solves it. And I, and I don't think that there's evidence to suggest, at least my experience in the U.S., and, and it might be different in the U.K., any evidence to suggest that it actually practically works to shrink the role of government. So, for example, in the U.S., there's as much rights violation going on every day at city councils in deciding whether I can, what I should be allowed or not allowed to do on my land on my property, whether I can open a school, where I can open a school. I was involved in you know, opening a school at some point in Orange County, California. And the, the, the amount of lobbying and taking out city council members, the lunches, and the corruption just becomes more intimate. But, you know, the, uh, are people going to be upset about that corruption? No, because the next time they want something, they'll use the same tools. So I, I think it's inherently... Uh, corrupting in size just makes that corruption more intimate, but it doesn't really change the nature of the corruption. <laughs> uh, and I think, and I think it, uh, I think you give up a huge amount. You give up the principle. You're giving up the principle of individualism. You're giving up the principle of individual rights. You're, you're accepting the notion that what matters is a majority. The size of the majority, the size of the voting group, you know, shouldn't matter. What's important is the individual. What's important is, is it, are his rights being protected or are they not being protected? Can he use his land any way he chooses to or not? And I think that the size of the group that is violating his rights is irrelevant and, and plays into the hands of, you know, the socialists who... I, you know, can also organize on the local level and probably get as much influence on local politics because I think I think in our culture they have them all high ground because our culture has adopted their ethics and therefore they have much more influence with people. Uh, do you think that the United States and the UK have the right to invade Afghanistan? What gives any political entity, a country, a right to exist in a sense as a political entity? And I'd say what gives it is the extent to which it defends the rights of its citizens. That is, a, a government is only legitimate to the extent that it protects the sovereignty of its individual. Governments don't have, countries don't have sovereignty. Only individuals have sovereignty. You own your own life. To the extent that you grant your government legitimacy, is to the extent it's legitimate. If, if, if it's any dictatorship in mind, therefore, it's illegitimate. Any country that systematically violates the rights of its citizen, what does it mean to say Saddam Hussein has sovereignty over Iraq? I mean, that's bizarre. He is a murderous thug who killed his own people in mass, who didn't have, didn't allow individual rights in any respect in anybody, anybody in his country, yet he has sovereignty over Iraq. No, he's completely legitimate. Anybody could have invaded any government of him, and they want to be completely legitimate. Now, the question is, should you invade to get rid of Saddam That, in my view, is completely a question of, you know, your own um, interests. That is, was it in America's self-interest to invade you up? In my view, the answer, ultimately, is no. Was it in America's self-interest to invade Afghanistan. Probably, but not the way they did it. Um, so it really is a question of self-defense. And so what is it? Self-interest. The ultimate devotion is not this. Is it crucial for American self-defense to invade Iraq? If, it is, if the answer is yes, then you invade it. If the answer is no, then you don't invade it. The, the legitimacy, the, the, the sovereignty of Iraq is relevant to the question. Now, if you're talking about France, then there is a question of sovereignty, because it is a legitimate government. You know, it is rights respecting, at least to an extent, 
you know, just as Britain is, just as America is. They're all mixed, right? They're not pure, but they're all mixed. But look, I can see by your face. Would you disagree, Bill? If you think, if you think that France, or take the UK, that the UK or France, on the same scale of rights violation as Iraq is, you completely detach from reality. Why is the line there? Well, the line, in my view, the line is that the four characteristics of a, of a state, I think that, let me see if I can remember all four, but the four characteristics of a state that is illegitimate completely, that is basically a dictatorship but totalitarianism. One party rule. Um, whether, you know, uh, whether you have, the most important one in my view is whether you have censorship or not, free of speech. And to the extent to which it is applied, um, whether you have any kind of any kind of elected government, you know. Okay, so those two. But the keys, in my view, are some kind of one-party rule which denies any kind of election and and uh, freedom of speech. As long as you have freedom of speech in a country, there's some freedom left in that country. There's some way to use reason and thought and and argument and discussion in order to change the world in which you live. When freedom of speech is gone, you're basically living in dictatorship, in which your only means of dealing with change is through violence, through revolution, bringing you know, taking arms and revolting against the government. So, a country that rejects all notions of speech, which clearly Iraq did, which clearly France and Britain and America don't, that's freedom of speech. I'm, I'm here, right? I'm not a very popular guy. I was just in Israel. There's freedom of speech in Israel. I could speak in France. I've spoken in most of Europe. You know, there's basically freedom of speech in the West and in much of Asia. You know, China is an interesting mixed case. There's clearly less freedom of speech in China. There is one part of rule in China. You know, China's not a, you know, China's probably the one, the most borderline you're going to get. But clearly, Europe, the US, Japan, the Koreas are fundamentally free countries. They're not as free as we'd like, but they're fundamentally free. And clearly, North Korea, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, and I can think of a bunch of others, are not free in a fundamental sense. There's a, there's a difference between the two. And all you'd have to do is go visit those places. Not for very long. And you would notice that there is a stark, stark difference. Now, is the US and England what we want them to be? No, absolutely not. They're nowhere near as free as they should be. But they are much freer than these guys, and therefore much more they're much more moral and much more and therefore legitimate regimes versus these that are not legitimate regimes. So the North Korean regime is not a legitimate regime. Somebody wants to invade them and get rid of the guy, all the power to you. I wouldn't do it because my life's not worth risking for the sake of the North Koreans. But you know, if you want to do it, that's your business. And answer your question. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I think you mentioned the word capitalism to most people in the street, that definitions are completely corrupted and they don't think of freedom and individual rights. They think of people who are only concerned with money, which is a bad thing, um, fat cats, selfish people, cold hearted people. So, how, how does that come about and how do we get around it? Well, I, I think to some extent we have to package a package deal that people have there. You said a number of things that I think capitalism does stand for. For example, selfishness. I think capitalism is selfish. Um, it stands for making lots of money. Sure, it does. And what we need to convince people is that those things are good things, not bad things. That is, people pursuing their own self-interest, people living their lives to the best of their ability, making the most out of their lives is a good thing, and that's pretty selfish, right? It's about my life, not about your life. Um, we need to convince people that rational self-interest is good that they, each one of them, see to me, the battle about capitalism is all about ethics ultimately. It's all about ethics. If we lose the battle on ethics, we lose the fight for capitalism, if we win it, we won, it's easy. If we can convince people that they have a right to live their life any way that they choose to, as long as they're not violating somebody else's right, and that life is worth living, and it's worth making the best and most out of your life. The capitalism is easy, because all capitalism is, is a system that leaves you alone to do that. If we can convince people that they are not their brother's keeper, that they are not morally responsible for the group 
and their neighbor and their community and their race and their ethnic group or whatever the, the latest fad is. We convince them that they're not morally responsible for them. They can take care of them if they want to. You know, they're free to help their friends. But they're not morally obligated as the essence of who they are to live for the sake of other people. Their moral obligation is to live for themselves. Make the most out of their life, to thrive. Then, you know, then you ask them, okay, well, if you want to live the best life that you can live, then the question is, what kind of political system? Well, you want a political system that allows you to do that, to pursue what you think is right. You know what, if you think communism is the best thing, you want to live in a commune, capitalism allows you to do that. You can go off somewhere and start your own commune and live there. The whole notion is that forces are being used. If you want to voluntarily go and live in some ridiculous setup, then that's your business. So the notion is that everybody, everybody is willing to think, is willing to work, is better off, better off when Big Brother is not telling them what they should and shouldn't do. And I think that's the real core of it, because if you just talk economics, it's confusing and it's difficult, and there's so many things going on, but you have to make it real to people that it's about their choices, it's about their lives, it's about you know, other people telling them what they should and shouldn't do. Nobody likes that. And that, that's the appeal. That's why, by the way, I Man is so appealing to the teenagers, because that's the age where we certainly don't like being told them. What to do, right? And and we read and suddenly this book legitimizes our wanting to, to live our own lives our own way. And and you know, she gives you a whole a whole idea of what that means and how to do that, but it's it's appealing to that time in our lives where we're challenging. Yeah. Uh, what happens when you have two equally legitimate but conflicting enable rights? Yeah. How do you work out that conflict? Because I, I I don't think it exists. Uh, two people in the sea, I'm sorry this hypothetical, but I promise you, practical examples exist. Um, two people on a boat in the sea that will only support one of them, neither of them own the boat, and they're both legitimate right to life. Look, individual rights don't exist on a lifeboat. There is no such thing. Morality is not about lifeboats. Morality is about day to day living. Morality is about what really happens in real life. What on, a, on a lifeboat, all of the Titanic in emergency situations, Whatever happens, happens. You know, you throw the guy over, and you live, or you jump over and you commit suicide. Both choices are horrible. They're really, really bad, but that's not what life is about. In an emergency, you know, do what it takes. But life is not an emergency. 99.9999999% of life is not emergency. And ethics, and intellectual pursuits, and politics, and philosophy is not about the point zero 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 one percent of lifeboat situations. They're just not interested. They're boring. Because that means that for every person who is so poor that they're in an emergency, any action is legitimated. No, because somebody, uh, people who are poor are not in an emergency situ situation. People who are poor can go and work. People who are poor can go and beg. People who are poor can go to a charity and ask for charity. There are a thousand opportunities for people who are poor to, to gain the things that they need in order to survive. It's not an emergency. It's not a light bulb situation, which is truly the only situation in life, or in 0.0001% of life, where it's a zero-sum game. But life is not about a zero-sum game. Life is about win-win situations all around us, all the time. The essence of human interaction is win-win. It's not lose lose, which is what a light boat is. Light boat is no winners. You're screwed. <laughs> but that's not right. That's not right. Poor people, uh, you know, there are lots of jobs out there, particularly under capitalism. There are more jobs than you can fill under capitalism. There's negative unemployment in capitalism. There's, a, there's always a deficiency of, of, uh, of jobs under capitalism. If you just lower the minimum wage to zero, and you'll see how many jobs are created just like that. I mean, unemployed, a big, not everybody, but a big chunk of the unemployed in any society are those people who just can't produce up to the level of the minimum wage. They're just not worth 10 bucks an hour, as ugly as it is to say it. They're just not worth it. They're worth five. But they live a better life earning five than they do unemployed. But we deny them the job that will pay them five. And then we're surprised when jobs go to China or somewhere else. Because we're denying them here. We're rejecting their ability to make a living here. 
Yeah, I have a question about intellectual property, but um, I just wanted to comment on the war thing, just briefly. It seems to me that when you start to talk about war, uh, you've already denounced states' rights, but when you start to talk about war, all of a sudden, now you're, you're right on the states' rights thing, and the states' right to defend itself, and you've forgotten about the individual rights. And so can I, can I deal with that before you ask the sure, question? Yeah, yeah. No. The study is one I what I've denied is states' rights in the context of the U.S. as states and a government. The government doesn't have any rights. Governments don't have rights. But governments have responsibilities. Government has one function and one function only. And that function is to defend the individual rights of its citizens. That's it. It doesn't have any other responsibility. You not provide health care, and not, to, not to, to provide for the poor, and not to provide for anything except to protect the individual rights. So if somebody comes jumping at me with a, with a machine gun, trying to shoot me. It's the government's job to jump in and shoot them before they get to me. And sometimes, when they're shooting the bad guy, some innocent bystanders might get shot and killed. And that's sad, and that's unfortunate. But whose responsibility is that? It's the guy who was wielding the machine gun to begin with and trying to kill me. It's his responsibility. So, when I talk about going to war, I'm talking about going to war as my representative to defend my rights when somebody is trying to violate them. Somebody is running at me, you know, with a nuke or a machine gun or a whatever it happens to be, and then it's my government's job to go out and kill them and do whatever is necessary to prevent them from ever coming at me again with a machine gun. And that is, an, that is not an issue of government rights, it's an issue of Individual rights, 300 million American individual rights, should have demanded, and didn't demand, but should have demanded that the American government do whatever was necessary to stop Al Qaeda, and in my view, Islamic totalitarianism, from ever striking America again. And that's the job of America, the American government. Now, then you get into question should we invade in Iraq or in defending my rights? <coughs> Should we go after Iraq or Afghanistan or Saudi Arabia or Iran? That was a technical, you know, you know, military question. Those aren't questions of rights anymore. Now it's a question of, in protecting my rights, who do we bomb? You know, I have my ideas on who should have been bombed and wasn't, uh, and, and what should have been done and wasn't. But it's not an issue of the state having rights, it's an issue of me having rights as an American. Okay, well, uh, I won't pursue that, but um, I just want to say that intellectual property. Uh, I, I feel that the intellectual property position here is wrong if uh, Ayn Rand would say uh, that there's absolute uh, intellectual property rights as well, or at least... Yes. Um, but how do you respond to that? I mean, that doesn't, to me that doesn't seem rational, because if you have an idea, you know, you need the state to protect that idea under intellectual property. And there are, this guy over here can have the same idea, and I can't prove that he didn't come up with that idea independently. Sure, I can only say it looks a lot like mine. So it's not, I mean, with intellectual property rights, it's not a question of him just stealing stuff written on a piece of paper, it's a question of him, you know, how, how do you... Say it absolutely protects your idea. You can have whatever ideas you want. Nobody, nobody is going to take those ideas away from you. What the state is protecting is a physical manifestation of those ideas. That is the actual product. That is the consequence of those ideas. And that is a physical thing. That is, if you have an idea... You know, but it's not an exclusive privilege. It's an exclusive privilege to produce, absolutely. The fact that you have an idea doesn't give you an automatic right to make something if making that something violates the intellectual property of somebody else who had the idea before you and, and is producing that thing based on that idea. You can still hold that idea in your head, nobody can go in and zap it away, but you just can't act on it. The action is now the rights of somebody else. Uh, it, it is bizarre to me that the most important creation that we're all engaged in, which is ideas, right? that is the most important creation. Every product out there ultimately started as an idea. Everything, everything out there is about ultimately ideas. It, you know, Ayn Rand believed very much that the, ultra, the only power of creation is reason, ideas, otherwise. That somehow, we don't protect that under property rights. That is the one thing that we truly do create. And if somebody else got to the marketplace before you based on the idea that he had and made stuff, it's his. That patent 
That idea that he registered is his, and therefore it's the goal of government to protect that manifestation of that idea in reality. Uh, and I think it's I think it's a, it's a it's a real mistake uh, for libertarians to reject that because if you reject that, I think all property goes because all property ultimately all property ultimately is intellectual. Given that there's no pure capitalist state at the moment. And secondly, we should buy a legitimate country as one that has more than one party system. Do you think these ideas you're speaking about will result in a stable government? So do I think capitalism will result in a stable government? The ideas you're using will result in a stable government. Yes. So that you have to have a two party system. Well, you have to have a multi party system. And it doesn't exist anywhere now. Yes. I mean, Note that the, the essence the essence is not the multi party system. The essence is because, for example, uh, the founding fathers of the U.S. didn't believe there should be any parties. They they thought everybody should run as an individual, uh, and there should be, in that sense, no parties. And that that could be the outcome. I don't know what the outcome ultimately would be. It didn't succeed. It. They reverted to parties very very quickly after. Uh, yes, but I, I think if you define government clue, the role of government clue. You define what it's supposed to do. You put the boundaries on it very clearly um, and uh, unambiguously. And unfortunately, the American Constitution has a lot of ambiguity in it, at least to our modern uh, reading of it. Um, then there's still room for debate and discussion. For example, uh, how do we apply ideas of property rights to the internet? Not obvious. Right? Not just something, oh, we could legitimately disagree about these issues. But the principle is applying the concept of individual rights to the internet. And the principle is non initiation of force. And now we can have a robust political debate about how we do, we do that and what's the right approach and so on under those parameters. Now, will politics be a big deal? No. I don't think so. I don't think politicians. Where it will be that interesting of a profession or that important of a profession, because I think that the government will do very little. You know, it maybe it only needs to meet. You know, Congress only needs to meet three months a year. Probably doesn't need twelve months because what do they do? There's not that much to do. Right? Most of the time, they need, they, I think to this day the legislature in Texas only meets every other year. They don't even meet all the time. And, you know, Texas is probably the freest of the states, among the freest of the states in the United States. So you get part-time politicians, you know, uh, a working man who do this in addition to their real job. You get robust debates about real issues, about applying the concept of the right. Uh, you'd probably get some multi-party system, but maybe not. Maybe it would all be individuals. I don't know how it will all play out. The, 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 the essence of stability is two things. Getting the Constitution right, unambiguous and right. And second, having a culture in which that constitution, um, that people believe in that constitution. So you can have the best constitution in the world, and if people don't believe in it, it's irrelevant. So the United States has a pretty good constitution, probably the best in the world. Not perfect, but really, really good. But people stopped believing in it 100 years ago. So and, and our schools stopped educating about it 100 years ago. And, the ethics that are prevalent in the culture is anti the ethics of the Constitution. And so, what's happened? The Constitution is slowly being chipped away and eroded at, and, and the Supreme Court keeps ruling against what the true nature of the Constitution is because they don't understand it, because they've lost the intellectual path back to what the Constitution really meant. So, you need philosophically a culture that believes, continues to believe, that that Constitution, that system of government, is right in order for it to sustain. Yeah, we often hear about human rights abuses in the media, and uh, perhaps a good example of that would be about time of day. Now, regarding your views on individual rights, and time of day is a is of the worst, how would you react to one time of day situation? Um, people who try to kill me don't have rights. It's just a fact. When you violate somebody else's rights, you lose your own. All of them. You steal an apple. You lost your rights. The government's job is then to take you and figure out what the just punishment is. If you're stealing an apple, the just punishment, you know, is a slap on the wrist in a couple of days in jail, maybe, or whatever. But if you're trying to kill people, then 
that just punishment is your own death, in my view. Or at least putting you away for the rest of your life. Uh, it is my belief, and I don't want to get into a lot of discussion, I know those of you who are staunch libertarians, and there's a difference between objectivists and libertarians. Here. Those of you who are staunch libertarians are really upset about my foreign policy views. <laughs> but, you know, we're not here to really discuss foreign policy. Um, the people in Guantanamo Bay were trying to kill me. They were out to kill Americans. They were caught on the battlefield with guns in their hands, trying to shoot Americans that under, you know, that were there to defend me, defend Americans, and were there, in my view, mistakenly, to bring freedom to the Afghans. And they weren't even there to oppress the Afghans and turn them to slavery. They were there to free them. And these people were shooting at them. That's how freedom loving these guys are. I, I don't know what human rights violations happened in Guantanamo. I don't think any did. What? The fact that they took a Quran and flushed it down the toilet? I mean, I can think of, uh, I don't view that as a, as a human rights violation. Um, they probably did, they probably did the people their favor. Um, I guess that's a mic. So, look, war is hell. War is a bad thing, it's not a good thing. But the only responsibility of a government going to war, and assuming it's a just war, that is, it's a war in self-defense, the, the only justice of a war is to defend yourself. When you go to defend yourself, you do whatever is necessary to win. That's the only consideration you should have. You know, and, and when the West had that approach to fighting wars, they won. You know, and that will involve killing a lot of innocent people. I'm the, I'm the one guy who's not embarrassed to say that. When you go to war, innocent people are going to die. Many innocent people. Just ask the children in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They died. They were innocent. You can talk about the adults and question how innocent they really were. But the children clearly were innocent, right? They had nothing to do with the school, but they died. It's sad. And it's the fault of the Japanese. It's not the fault of Truman. It's the fault of the Japanese. They should have started World War II. Many children died in Dresden. Sad for the children. Tragic, even. Whose fault is it? Hitler's. Not Churchill for approving the bombing of Dresden. Indeed, Churchill and Truman are moral, ethical heroes for doing that and ending those wars and minimizing the casualties of their own people, and ultimately in Japan, of the Japanese themselves, but certainly of American troops. They are heroes for having them all backbone to, to, be, to, to, you know, to do what was necessary to win. We today don't have that moral backbone, and therefore we fight unwinnable wars, endless wars, wars with no end. Many, 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 many people are still going to die in the war we are fighting because we're not willing to win this. We're not willing to do what's necessary. Non foreign policy questions. Now, if we have time, I'll get to those. But. Yeah. <coughs> this is almost foreign policy, but almost how would you want the military to be funded if not by. Oh, that's a better question. Um, through voluntary taxation. That is, I don't believe in compulsory taxation. It's theft. You know, even if it's just a little bit, it's still theft. Uh, but. You know, I don't know about you guys, but right now the government takes about 50 plus percent of my income. Actually, if you take into account everything, the government actually takes it away from me 60 plus percent of my income, maybe closer to 70 percent. It also reduces my standard of living dramatically through all the regulations and everything else going on in the world. Imagine that all went away. People are truly free. I'd have my 60-70% of my income back, but I'd be making a lot more money in real terms because the economy would be, you know, I think the U.S. could grow at 8-9% GDP growth a year. I don't think there are any boundaries to economic growth. I mean, imagine the technologies and the advancement and the quality of life and the standard of living and life longevity and everything like that. Would I be willing to take a percentage of my pay and voluntarily pay for military and police? Absolutely, I'd be happy to do it. Who am I protecting? Me and my values and my property and my goods. Would most people be willing? Yes. Uh, is there going to be a small minority who's not? Sure. Do we call them an economic free riders? Yes. 
Do I care? No. What's that? You can't be excluded from the benefit of having a military. So That's true. So what? So you've got a public good public. No, you don't. People are happy to fund goods that they are direct beneficiaries of, even if other people benefit for free. In, in the old America, in the 19th century America, people built roads. They built roads. And they didn't charge a levy for using it. People just used the roads. Because they wanted to get from point A to point B. And they got enormous economic benefits from getting from point A to point B. And if a thousand other people got smaller economic benefits from getting from point A to point B, what did they care? There's very little cost to maintaining that road. And yet the benefits are huge. So, look, they are every single day, all of us, benefit enormously from positive externalities. People like to talk about negative externalities. But there are many, many, many more positive externalities in the world we live in than negative externalities. How many of you actually pay the true value to you of all the products that you use? I mean, think about what your computer really, really needs to you. All the benefits that you get throughout an entire lifetime of having the computer, and not just you having the computer, but that the computers exist and that society is all computerized. I mean, is it worth a thousand bucks to you? No, it's worth millions of dollars to you. If you really think about what it's worth to you as a cumulative of its impact on all society, yet you pay a thousand bucks, but the fact that the computer industry exists is an enormous positive externality on it. If you were forced to pay the true cost, whatever the hell that means, of, of, I mean, but that's not how markets work. Markets are all about positive externalities, enormous positive externalities. Not to mention the little ones. Of them. You, know, you know, we all talk about these negatives, but the negatives are trivial as compared to positive. Now, the free wider problem is not a problem. So they're free riders. I'm still willing, it's still, you know, the police force is there to protect me. Yes, I could go through the calculation, well, I won't pay, but my neighbors will. But I want to pay because these are good guys and they're protecting me. And I value my life. And if you're rational, you would want to do that. And if we ever reach a point where we actually have a free society, most people will be rational. So we're not going to reach there with you asking. So they would be happy to pay for the services that they actually get. Is the reason you don't steal when you go into a store? Is the only reason you don't steal because you'll get caught? How many of you pay when you go to the store because it's the right thing to do? Because you got a service and you want to compensate the other side for the service. Well, I hope most of you. If you could get away with stealing, would you do it? No. So why wouldn't you pay for police if you're getting that service? So, hopefully you that. Um, going back to your point about some of the use of possibly private companies in our national security, yeah. I'd like to direct you to the things of South Africa. Where the um, government does actually use private companies as police, and the result has been actually what you talking about again. The, um, the police was actually lobby federal police to police them, and it's resulted in you know, corruption, uh, them beating up certain crime laws, leaving us alone. Like, we should not see this as a possible problem with your tradition. Oh yes, I don't believe in private police forces. I'm not an anarchist. I don't believe in private police forces. The state should control the police forces, control the military. I don't believe in private contractors for for doing police work and for doing military work. You know, that's the job of the state. It's the only job of the state. They have only one job. They run a police force right, they run a military right, and they should do it. And South Africa, you know, those kind of examples are great examples of the fact that private police forces don't work. They corrupt. They're, they're corrupting, and they ultimately result in uh, gang war. My gang versus your gang. My police force versus your gang. Um, given the emphasis on rationality, would you consider an individual who doesn't infringe on other people's rights but is irrational, would you consider him to be immoral or just stupid? Well, I mean, by the very nature of saying he's irrational, you're saying that he's not necessarily stupid. I mean, I know a lot of very, very smart people who are irrational um, in certain aspects of their life, or maybe in most of the aspects of their life. I would consider him immoral. Morality, fundamentally, in according to Ayn Rand, is about using your reason. It's about using rational thought in order to pursue your values, in order to to, uh, to pursue your life, to make your life the best life it can be, her, 
the primary value is a reason for the self-esteem. So if you're not assuming the primary value, then you're obviously you know, not moral. Uh, so rationality is an issue of morality, it's not an issue of ability. You can be have a very low IQ and be rational. You can have a, be a very high IQ and be completely utterly irrational. Plenty of examples of that, unfortunately, in our society. So I think that whether you apply your mind or not, in, I, in other words, whether you think rationally or not, this is the, for Ayn Rand, the fundamental ethical questions. Whether you engage your mind with reality, soul problems, and, the only, and that's what rationality is, it's engaging your mind with reality, soul problems, and identifying, figure stuff out. That's the essence of morality, and I know that's, very different way of looking at morality than what is common, but that's for who? That's because she's an individual. She's about morality is about making the most out of your life. And where do we get the values that are necessary for us to pursue our life? From rational thought. If you don't engage in rational thought, you can't pursue the values that are requirement for your life. Therefore, you are not engaged in morality. Why not? Um, if you haven't really talked very much about children and those who are helpless. Yes. Um, how would you see an objectivist society handling the case of say, a small family, the parents are killed in an accident, those children uh, perhaps don't have any other relatives? What's to be done? How, how, would, you, how would you fund their care? Um, so the children and their poor, so we've got another yes. way. Yes. <laughs> well, no, with single family, if they were poor, they could be helpless. These are children. Yes. No, look, children are. Uh, children uh, have, uh, you know, their parents, in a sense, hold their rights um, in. Um, yeah, in a trust, in a sense. Uh, children don't have. They don't em embody the full rights because they're not fully rational. Essence, they're not capable of dealing with the world, and parents, that's their responsibility. The responsibility is, is uh, to help them get to the point where they are, you know, where they're adults and they, they take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. um, in a case like that, in an objective society, I have no doubt that a charitable entity would come in and help those kids uh, and take care of them. I, I think it would ultimately be up to private charities to take care of the poor. Of the helpless, you know, you can imagine somebody born a quadriplegic, you know, just can't take care of themselves. Then it's their family that'll take care of them, or it'll be a charity that'll take care of them. What isn't legitimate? What isn't legitimate is that I be forced to take care of them. I can be approached, and you know, I can be reasoned with. I can be, you know, people can ask me to help them, but they have no right to pull out a gun and force me. And as soon as you have government doing that, then you're basically the only role the government is going to have to defend your rights. If the parents are abusing the kids, then government has a role to step in and stop that abuse. Because the rights are being violated. The trust that the parents are holding is, is being violated. Um, but if the parent, if, if the kids run away from home, if they're just poor, if they just, that is an issue for charity. It's not an issue for state. And supposing you have somebody couldn't support themselves because of some hand. And they and couldn't get charity yeah. and nobody would so help. Yes, they, they would die. They die. And they would die. But I don't think that would happen. I don't think there's any evidence in in uh, in American history, which is which is history, which, or even in, in the history of you know other places that have approached freedom. I mean, everybody's just approached it, they've never attained it. You know, even in a place like Hong Kong, as brutal of a place it is, as poor of a place it was, at least for some people, but free. People weren't dying in the streets. People were taken care of. There were charities, even in the, in, the, in the poorest of places. There was no welfare state in Hong Kong for, for, for many, many years. And yet people, by the millions, by, by the hundreds of thousands at least, emigrated in, right? People were escaping to get the welfare of other countries. People were coming in. I mean, that's, that to me should indicate something that in every free country in a history, to the extent that they are free, people want to move it. People are not clamoring. I mean, some people want to come into the welfare state, but people certainly are not clamoring 
We're climbing to go to the Soviet Union. People are climbing to go to North Korea. They want emigrating to you all. I mean, that's, that's an indication of, of, of a legitimate country and an illegitimate country. It's just a proxy. The degree to which people want to move there. People want to go to Japan, even though the Japanese won't let them in. People want to go to South Korea. They won't let them in. People want to come to America. They want to come to the UK. They don't want to go to North Korea. They don't want to go to Iraq. Arabs want to come to Israel. They don't want to go to the West Bank. They don't want to go to Jordan. But if Israel opened up its job to Arabs from all over the Middle East, it could attract millions and millions of Arabs to come and work in Israel. Because Arabs in Israel are freer than they are in any other country in the Middle East. And indeed, and this has nothing to do with our topic today, but indeed, just a historical fact, uh, between 1890 and 1948 when the State of Israel was established, the, the Palestinian, so-called Palestinian, the Arab population of Israel grew dramatically. Not because of birth rates, but because of in-migration from Syria, from Lebanon, from Jordan, and from Egypt, and from Iraq, and from everywhere. Why? Because those nasty Jews were building industries, they were building businesses, they were building roads, they were creating civilization, they were creating activity, and all these Arabs wanted jobs. So they came, so all the Palestinian problem, the so-called Palestinian problem that exists today, is all the fault of the Jews for building up a semi-free country to begin with. Because those Palestinians could have been slaves in Syria and you know, Jordan and anywhere else today, and they wouldn't be so-called refugees in, in Palestine. But capitalism, freedom, individualism creates prosperity. And, and so prosperity again is a pro is a proxy for freedom. Uh, and where people are do it poor, I can guarantee you they're also unfree. And you can direct correlation. Go uh, travel a little bit around the world that you can see. You done? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Small token of our appreciation. Um, <laughs> thank, thank you to you on what's more.